Now begin to receive the blessings of God as we enter into a new month, new things, new testimonies, new favor, new help. Amen and Amen. Praise God. We have been looking at the topic, the creative power of God, and I have a quick exhortation for us this morning. We're going to be reading from the book of Job chapter 7. I'm sorry, Job chapter 28. Job chapter 28. We're going to be reading from verse 7 to verse 23 as we look at wisdom, the wisdom of God. Amen. Remember I shared with us from the book of James <clears throat> that there are four kinds of wisdom. If, we, if you were here the first Sunday of the month, I said there are four kinds of wisdom according to scriptures. There is first the earthly wisdom. The earthly wisdom. That is the wisdom that comes with common sense. Amen. If you want to step, if you want to move forward, you don't move with two legs. Right? You take one leg first, and then you take the other leg. That's common sense, right? This is the kind of wisdom that you get through Proverbs, uh, Proverbs, parables, all that stuff. And there's also the sensual wisdom. That's the one you go to school for. That's the one you take a class, you watch YouTube for, all right? There's sensual wisdom. There is devilish wisdom. That is the wisdom of the devil, the wisdom of the wicked, not the devil. The devil has no wisdom. The wisdom of the wicked. They twat the things of the kingdom to deceive people. Right? They, they, they manipulate scriptures to put people in fear, in bondage. That is evil wisdom. And there is the wisdom of God. There is the wisdom of God. And so we have been talking about the wisdom of God because it is the foundation of the creative power of God. Amen. So this scripture we want to look at this morning tells us the value of this wisdom of God. As we read through it, it's a very long uh, chapter, but I want you to see what this wisdom carries and how precious it is. So Job chapter 7, we read from verse, Job chapter 28, I'm sorry, we read from verse 7 to verse 23. Let's go. The Bible says, there is a path which no fowl knoweth. And which the vulture's eye had not seen. The lion's whelps have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. He put forth his hand upon the rock, he overturned the mountains by the roots, he cut out rivers among the rocks, and his eyes seeth every precious thing. He binded the floods from overflowing, and the thing that is hid. Bring it he forth to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof. Neither is it found in the land of the living. You can't find wisdom. God's kind of wisdom among men. You can't find it in the sea. This depth said it is not in me. Please go back to verse 12. The depth said it is not in me. The sea said... It is not in me. It cannot be gotten for gold. Divine wisdom. Neither shall silver be weighted for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of offer, with the precious oinks or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it. And the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral and of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living, and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. Verse 23. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. This morning, I want to share with us on a subtopic titled, The Channels of Wisdom. 
The channels of wisdom. You can write this down. The channels of wisdom. How can you access the wisdom of God? I intentionally kept this part as the last part of this series because God saves the best for the last. I've taught about the purpose of wisdom. I've taught about the workings of wisdom. We've done the manifold wisdom of God. We have looked at wisdom from every nook and cranny. But I've intentionally kept how to get wisdom as the last because God saves the best for the last. This morning we're going to be looking at about six ways or six channels of accessing divine wisdom. How can you receive the wisdom that comes from God? How can you receive it? How can you access it? How can you manifest this kind of wisdom that comes from God? The first here point I have here is that the wisdom of God can be accessed through living right. Living right. Living in righteousness. God, God will only give his wisdom to his people. He will not give it to the multitude. He will give it to his people. That is why when Jesus was on the earth, he would speak in parables to the multitude and then he will call his disciples and tell them the meaning of the parables. He will give them the juice of the story, the morale of the story. He won't tell that to the multitude because the, 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 the wisdom of God is it's so precious, you cannot give it to the pigs. You cannot cast it to the swine. The precious wisdom of God is for only people that are living right. So for you to access the wisdom of God, you have to live. I have to live righteously. I have to live for God. I have to belong to the household of God. It's like when a man dies and he writes a will. When a man dies and he puts a will, anybody that is not on the will will not get anything. No matter how close the person is. As long as the name of the person is not on the wheel, the person is not going to get nothing. The wisdom of God has been written out for only the children of God. Coming to church does not qualify you for the wisdom of God. Having a Bible does not qualify you for the wisdom of God. You have to really be a child of God. You have to forsake sinful things. You have to stay away from living in wickedness, in sin. You have to neglect those sinful habits, those sinful thoughts, those sinful behaviors before you can qualify for the wisdom of God. If we go to that book of Job chapter 28, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord, it is the beginning of wisdom. Mm. Job 28, 28. Job 28, verse 28. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want God to start showing you ideas? You want God to start giving you innovations, inventions, solutions? You must first begin by fearing the Lord. And unto man he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. To fear the Lord is wisdom. Because when you fear the Lord, when you live righteously, you qualify for divine ideas. You qualify for divine wisdom. I remember the story of uh, my father and the Lord, Bishop David Oyedepo. They were doing a construction, and in the construction, while they were building, they were doing a building, and they put the trusses. Let me explain it this way. Imagine that you want to fit in a 16-foot truck through this door. That was the mistake the architect made. They didn't do their calculations very well, so they needed to bring in a piece of equipment into the building, and it wouldn't fit. So they were sitting there thinking of what to do. They were thinking of maybe cutting some things off, you know, shifting some things, you know. And they called him and said, Sir, if we do this, it's going to cost us extra extra money, extra time, extra labor. And it was much. <laughs> it was a costly mistake. And the Lord said to him, how much, 
height do they need extra? They said a few inches. I think they said about three or four inches. And the Lord said to him, ask them to deflate the tires of the truck and drag the truck in and then pump it back up when they move in. <laughs> That's genius. <laughs> To get that few inches they needed, instead of cutting all these things, he, the Lord just said to him, ask them to deflate the tires. It's going to be rough, but it's only for a few. Just drag it in, and then when you get back in, pump it up again. That is what saved them thousands of, of, of naira, which is the currency in Nigeria. So the wisdom of God is for only those. You, you can pray all you want. If you are not living right, God won't give you ideas. Because he will not give that which is holy. Like the Bible says, he won't give that which is holy to the pig. So we must live right. Please, the pleasures of sin is for a moment. It is not for life. But righteousness is for life. The pleasures of righteousness is lifetime. It's for a lifetime. The pleasures of sin is for a moment. A moment and it's gone. In fact, the consequences of sin outlives the sin and even outlives the sinner. We must be careful. We must stay away from every appearance of evil so that we can receive this kind of wisdom of God. The wisdom of God for ideas, creative ideas, innovation, inventions. If I was not a preacher, if I was not an, a preacher, you know I would be an innovator. I know that. If I was not a preacher, I would be an innovator. I know that. Because there are several ideas that God had given to me that if I decide to pursue it, I won't pursue anything else. Several ideas. When I was in, gra when I was in grad school, yes. When I was in grad school, we had a final year project. And I told them, I said, I gave them an idea. I said, let's work on this for our final year project. And everybody said, what is the idea? And I shared it with them. You know how when, you're, when you have an emergency and you, you're approaching the door to the emergency room, doctors are, you know, they put the person on the wheelchair or what, what device. I shared an idea with them where before they get to the operating room, all the information of the patient and everything about the patient would already be available to the operating theater. I gave them that technology. I said, let's work on this device that can transmit. I'm not talking about iPad or people trying to type things. The one that can transmit information immediately to save that one second or two seconds before the patient gets to the theater. And everybody's mind was blown away. If I sit down to pursue that, I would be an in innovator. I won't preach. <laughs> So God has given me the ability to preach, to share these ideas with people that can run with it, to be a blessing to you. And that's what I do for a living. I'm a continuous improvement manager. Wherever I go, I help them improve their processes to save money or to make money. That's how God has wired me. And that's my purpose on the earth. But I'm saying this to tell you that God can give you ideas about your business. God can give you ideas to make money where people are not seeing it. The Bible says in every profit, every, in, every, in every labor there is profit. But first, the primary requirement is to be saved, to be a child of God, to stay away from the things that displeases God. We must be smart and not let the devil rob us of this precious inheritance of wisdom from God. The Lord will help us. I know someone will say it's easier said than done. I understand. I'm a human like, you, like yourself. And that's why I pray that the Lord will help us to stay away from everything that displeases God in Jesus' name. Number two, how do you access wisdom? For you to access wisdom, you have to pray for it. You have to pray for it. The Bible says it explicitly. James chapter 1 verse 5. James chapter 1 and verse 5. You need a solution, pray for it. 
You need an idea, pray for it. <laughs> you need a wisdom. Somebody ask you a tough question. Before you answer, pray for it. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack, lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Let him ask God. Let him talk to him about God. Huh? Because God is the one who gives to all men liberally and upbraided not, and it shall be given him. There is a guarantee that when you ask God through prayers, you will receive wisdom. You will receive wisdom. How do you deal with difficult people? You need to ask God. You need to ask God. Difficult people are difficult. <laughs> they are difficult. They are difficult. How do you avoid troubles in the neighborhood or at work? You need to ask God. You can ask God, how do I, how do I position myself for the next promotion? What do I need to do differently to get this contract as a businessman? Ask God. If you don't know, don't make it up. Just ask God. It's easy. That's why the Bible says, and God will give it to him. But please, put that scripture back on the screen. It's not conditional. When you ask, he will give you wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Look at the last part. And it shall be given. You will surely receive from the Lord when you ask him. When you ask him, it is guaranteed. You are already pre-approved. <laughs> Let me use credit terminologies. You are pre-approved. Amen. And you will be given that wisdom of God. You will be given that idea. If somebody is trying to trick you and you want to know the truth, just ask God. Just ask God. Someone is trying to play a fast one on you. Even in an area of life where you know nothing. Let me use this as, as an example. And, and this is probably a bad example because George is a mechanic. But George is, I'm not talking about George. Imagine that you don't know anything about cars. And, you know, so you take your car to the mechanic shop and they tell you you need all the bells and whistles. And, you know, the way they, they tell you, they make it sound like, yeah, you need it now. Like, if you drive out of here, the car is going to explode. <laughs> make it sound like, oh man, if you live here there's going to be a big explosion. You can ask the Holy Spirit, do I really need this? And he'll tell you if you do or not. Do I need it now? He will tell you. And you can get out of those kind of situations. If you need wisdom in an area of life, just ask God and it will be given to you. So prayers are important when it comes to receiving or accessing the wisdom of God. I give you an example. In Daniel chapter 2, there was a story of how Daniel was brought before the king to interpret the, the dream. Daniel chapter 2, if you read from verse 17 to 19, the king had a dream. And the king forgot his dream. And he called all the magicians and all the wise men and said, Hey, come tell me my dream and tell me the interpretation. I have never, <laughs> I've never seen a wicked, such a wicked king before. He said, tell me my dream and tell me the interpretation. Otherwise, I kill all of you. How? I can understand the part of tell me the interpretation of my dreams. That means I'll tell you my dream. You tell me what it means. But for you to tell me my own dream and then interpret it, Otherwise, I kill you. Kill. Kill. It's like the king just wanted to kill somebody. <laughs> it's just like the king just felt like killing somebody that day. He called all of them and said, tell me my dream. What a difficult task. What a difficult king. But look at what Daniel did here. Daniel chapter 2 verse 17 to 19. Daniel went to his house and told his friends, hey, we're about to die. <laughs> he made the thing known to his friends, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. And what did they do? <laughs> then they would des desire messages of the God of heaven concerning the secrets that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And verse 19, 
Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel asked God, together with his companions, they asked God for this wisdom. They asked God, and God gave to them. In fact, if you go to verse 30 of that scripture, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 30, Daniel acknowledged that 100% that it was the wisdom of God. Daniel said, but as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that thou shalt make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mayest know the thoughts of thy heart. Daniel had to ask God in prayers and God revealed it to him in the visions of the night. Can I tell you something? Whenever you are asking God a question, pay attention to your dreams. Pay attention to your dreams. Maybe one of these days, I think I've done it before. Maybe I'll do it again. I need to teach on how God speaks. I need to, maybe I need to do that teaching again. Because I remember we did that before. Um, I think it was titled um, Hello Siri. I think that was the title. Hello Siri. Or Hi Siri or something like that. You know how you tell Siri, Hi Siri, and then Siri starts... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> One of the things you don't ask you is like, ah, I can't find that in the dictionary. Ah, I, you know, but I need to do that teaching again so you can understand how God speaks. God speaks. One of the ways God speaks is through the visions of the night. You may be asking God about something and you have a dream that is like a parable. It's not a direct answer or yes or no. It's like a story. In the dream, and then you will know from that dream that God was actually answering your prayers. That is exactly what happened to Daniel. God revealed the secret to him, but Daniel had to pray. So don't neglect the impact of prayer when it comes to accessing the wisdom of God. Prayer is important. Just ask God. Don't try to figure it out. Just sit down and ask God, and he will give it to you. Number three way of accessing Divine wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God, is through searching through the Bible. Through searching through the Bible. Searching through the scriptures. Searching through the scriptures. The Bible, I shared with us on Wednesday during the Bible study, I said this Bible is a book of answers to life's problems. It's a book of answers, but you have to search for the answers to find them. You have to search. That is why any time you want to read your Bible is when you fall asleep. Any time most people or some people want to read their Bible is when they fall asleep. They can be awake for football games. I have nothing against that. They can be awake to eat. They can be awake to gist or to chat with their friends. But when it's time to study the word of God, they fall asleep. Why? Because the devil knows that there is something in there that they need to find that will solve their problems. We must be ready to search the scriptures. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 8, we must be willing to sit down and go for the answers from scriptures. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says that ask, right? And it shall be given you. That's prayer. That's prayer. Seek. And you shall find. That is studying the word. Studying the word. And knock. And the door shall be opened to you. Huh. For everyone that asks, verse 8. Everyone that asks receives. And everyone that seeks will find. God is not trying to trick us. He's not trying to deceive us by putting this Bible before us. God said the answer is here. You just need to search for it. You can find solutions from scriptures to the challenges of life. You can find direct answers from scriptures 
that addresses the concerns of our hearts. We just need to sit down with the word of God and find it. Number one, I said, live right. Number two, pray. Number three, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Men that have lived before us. Men like Paul, the apostle. Men like Daniel. They have lived and served wisely because of the wisdom they found through books. Through books. Through the Bible. Through anointed books. You know, one of my favorite things that I like to do is I like to go for books that have a title that addresses the needs of my life. I'm not a fan of reading about fiction. I don't like, I don't enjoy reading fiction. I like reading, like, if you, if the title of the book is How to Grow a Church, for example, I'll buy it. I like the hows. I like biographies because I learn a lot from them. I'm looking for specific things. There's a book I'm reading now. Um, I, I, don't, I thought I had my bag here. It's in my bag. What I do is I open the chapter, the book, and I look through the table of contents. And I go specifically for that chapter that I'm wanting to learn. Sometimes I read the whole book, but when I'm looking for something intentionally, I will gather like five books. Maybe I'm reading about how to address uh, a, 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 a businessman. I will gather five books that talks about that, and I will go through the table of content, and I will look for specific chapters. I will read that, gather the wisdom from that, and then I will be able to use it. The same thing in scriptures. If you are looking for a child, go through the book of First Samuel. Go through the book of Genesis. Look at how, go to Genesis chapter 21, chapter 17, chapter 21. Look through those specific chapters. Read and find out what they did. And do the same thing. And God will do it for you. You want business explosion? Go and find out how men built their businesses. There was, I think, three or four months ago, I, I settled down and I talked about growing your business from scriptures. I gave us for four weeks how to grow your business from scriptures. You must settle down to find out whatever is a concern of your life. Whatever is a challenge. Whatever is bothering your heart. And you need wisdom. You need solutions for that. You can get it from the word of God. So go for the word of God. Daniel chapter 9 verse 2. Daniel said, and I, Daniel, understood by books, by books, by books. Don't ignore anointed materials. What anointed materials do is that they help us to understand the Bible. When anointed authors write books, they help us to have a deeper and a better understanding of the word of God. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years wherefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Let me tell you what happened there. The people were in desolation. Everybody was suffering. And they didn't know how long. It was indefinite. But Daniel took a book. And from the book, he found out that there was a prophecy from Jeremiah about what is happening. And Jeremiah prophesied that it was only going to be for 70 years. And when Daniel found out, it was past 70 years. So everybody was living in ignorance, in suffering. Daniel found it in the book that, wow, this was supposed to be for 70 years. So Daniel did something different. Daniel did something different. I remember the story of my friend. He's an attorney. And so he went to the court. And he was working for a chamber. He was, he was not practicing by himself. He was working for a chamber. And this was a very high-profile case in Nigeria. He was working for a senior advocate of Nigeria at the time. 
And, you know, the defendants were making some counterclaims and gaining grounds. And the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to him and said, Hey, read this particular book. Read this clause. And he went and found it. And when he found it, he whispered to his boss. I said, sir, I just found something. There is a clause here that says this and this and this. And that was what saved them from that case. They would have lost that case. The wisdom from the book. The wisdom, particularly from the word of God. We must make sure that we are searching. Paul was an avid reader of books. Paul was an avid reader. I love reading. I love studying. If you leave me alone to myself, you'll probably find me reading or listening to messages. I, I have many favorite preachers I love to listen to. In fact, I can do it without food. It doesn't bother me because I have an appetite. I know that once I hear the word of the Lord, I will know what to do concerning several areas of my life. Paul was an avid reader. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul asked them not to forget his books. He said, bring for me 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, hold on, I think that's probably 1 Timothy. Let me confirm. The books that I left in Troas bring ye with me and even my parchment. Let me check 1 Timothy. Let me look that real quick. Paul was an avid reader. He read and he, would, he, he took notes from what he read. Mm. The books which are left with you are trust. Is it 2 verse 13? 4 verse 13. Thank you. 4 verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. If you can help us put it on the screen. Yes. The cloak that I left at trust with Carpus. When thou comest, this was Paul, he had traveled and he forgot. <laughs> he forgot his books. He said, hey, hey, don't touch it. The cloak that I left at trust with Kapos, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. What is the parchment? A parchment is your notes. When you read, you take notes. All right? When I read a book, the way you know I've read the book is, and you see this first page here? See this, like every book here, I put, I put notes there. I put comments there. I put revelations there. And I put the dates. Paul had that kind of lifestyle. That's why I don't borrow people books. Because when I borrow you a book, and you have all my notes there, when I need the notes, <laughs> and I can't find you, I lose both the books and the notes. So I rather buy books for people. I don't borrow people books. I buy them what I can afford. I say, hey, go and buy your own. So we must be a searcher or a researcher of scriptures if we want to access the wisdom of God. Number four, how do you access divine wisdom? Is by choosing your friends. By choosing your friends. By being with the right company. By be, imagine that you are looking for a solution to a challenge in your life. And if you have the right friends and they all read different books, they will be able to tell you the answer. Instead of you sitting down to read 20 books, if you have two or three friends and each of you read three, three books, you will be able to access the answer faster. When you move with the right company of people, you'll be able to access wisdom better. The counsel of the wise is wisdom. The counsel, the advice of the right company is wisdom. If you move with people who are jealous of you, 
if you still call people who envy you friends, you are making a mistake. Because the day you tell them your challenge, the day you tell them the problems you're having, is the day they're going to amplify it and they're going to spread it around. But if you move with the wise, if you move with the wise company, you'll be able to get wisdom. You'll be able to get a good counsel, good advice from people who want to see you do well. Can I ask you today, please choose your friends wisely. It's going to help you in the long term. You have to choose your friends. Not everybody can be your friend. Be friendly to all, but choose your friends. Choose your confidence. Choose people that you can go to and ask questions. Choose people who are walking in the wisdom of God. Not only those who are walking with their sensual wisdom or with common sense. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20. It says, he that walks with the wise will be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. He that walk with the wise man shall be wise. Show me your friends and I will tell you how wise you are. Show me your confidence and I will tell you how wise you are. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. That tells me your friends are either wise or foolish. How the people you walk with, the people you call friends, will tell me how you will end your life. Will you end as a wise man? Or will you end as a foolish man? You must choose wisely. You must choose your friends wisely. You must be sure that the people you call friends have your genuine interest at heart. Don't choose a competitor as a friend. When your friend becomes your competitor, that's the end of the friendship. A friend should not be a competitor. You must not compete with your friend. You must want to see them do well. The characteristics of a friend is when you are in trouble, your friend should be able to bring you out of trouble, not leave you in your troubles. A, a company of wise people will always promote each other. They will always celebrate each other's success. You must be careful. Do you know that Jesus only had three friends? He had only three friends. In fact, he had only one closest friend. Multitudes were following Jesus. Out of the multitudes, he chose 70. Out of the 70, he chose 12. Out of the 12, he narrowed it down to three. Out of the three, there was only one that he could trust. And that was John the Beloved. In fact, when he was dying on the cross, he handed over his mother to John. He said, mother, take care of your child. Child, take care of your mother. You don't need many friends. You just need at least one good friend. At least. You can have 20 good friends, but... Be very, very meticulous about the kinds of friends you choose. If you choose the wrong friends, you have chosen trouble. If you choose the right friends, you have chosen wisdom. Friends that can help you in a time of difficulty. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says, Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. You must choose people who are brought up the same way you were brought up. The same values. Evil communications, evil company corrupt good manners. We were all raised different, but the value should remain the same. The values of respect, the values of honesty, the value of transparency, the values of hard work. If you don't find that in someone you call your friend, move on to the next. 
I'm teaching you practical wisdom. A lot of people have been hurt by their friends, but by people they call friends because they didn't choose them wisely. A lot of people have been betrayed by people they call confidence because they were never your friends in the first place. Well, my wife and I went to Israel. In one of the sessions, one of our mentors was, was speaking. And the first thing he said, he said, he said, when you get home, go and rechoose your friends. I can't forget that. Because my wife and I, and of course, that was the message. He listed some criteria of friends. For example, your friend must be able to tell you when you are wrong. If you have a friend that is a yes man, that's not your friend. Your friend must be able to stand and say, hey, you're going to be upset. You're not going to like what I'm saying, but it's the truth. You are wrong or you did what is wrong. Your friend must be able to tell you that. So my friend and I started to list the people that we called our friends. And we started asking ourselves questions. Can this person, has this person ever told me I'm wrong? Am I always right to this person? We started to narrow out. Do you know that some family members didn't make the list? Unfortunately, some family members didn't make the list. And I told her, I said, this person is our family member, is our relative, but is not our friend. We, we narrowed it down to maybe three or four people. Because what we call friends is like, it's like a twin brother or a twin sister. Someone where you share everything with. Someone who gets you. Someone who can help you. Someone who can give you sound advice. And sound counsel. In the days of trouble. So you want to be wise? Go and choose your friends again. Go and choose your friends. It's going to be painful. When you get home today, you sit down and start looking. How has this person contributed to my progress? What value is this person adding to me? Ask yourself those questions and you would see that not everybody around you is your friend. So if you need wisdom, you can get that through the right friends. In Genesis chapter 13 verse 5, the, the good thing about good friends is that whatever blessing they get, you get. Whatever blessing you get, they get. Whatever curses that they get, you also get. So that's why you must be careful. If your, friend, if your friend steals and people are cursing your friend, it will transfer to you too. That's why you must be careful. Genesis 13 verse 5, the Bible says, And Lot also, which went with Abraham, had herds and tents and flocks. Lot did not work for that. It was Abraham that worked for that. But Lot got that by reason of friendship to Abraham. By reason of association with Abraham. God did not promise Lot the blessing. God promised Abraham the blessing. But Lot was his nephew. But Lot learned that by association, I can connect with the blessing. I always tell people about this church. This is a church of blessing. This is a church of blessing. God has shown it to me. God has shown it to everybody, every other person. They know that those that connect with this church, the blessing of God flows to them. You can never be stranded as a member of this church. You can never be afflicted by the devil by being a member of this fold. You are like Lot. You were not there when the Lord spoke to me about the church. You were not there when we started. But by reason of fellowship, being a member, being a part of the body, you are beneficiaries of it. That's what Lot enjoyed. Lot was not there when God spoke to Abraham. Lot was not there when God swore a blessing. But Lot just simply followed. And the Bible says, And Lot also, which went with Abraham, he also had the same thing that Abraham had. He had flocks, he had herds, he had tents. And you know, in, back in the day, that was how they measured riches. That's how they know who is wealthy. The number of flocks you have, the number of tents you have, the number of livestock 
the number of farms. That's how they measure riches there. So your association is very critical. Let's hurry up. Let's take two more points and we close. How do you, what are the channels of wisdom? What are the channels of accessing divine wisdom? You can access divine wisdom by impartation. Impartation. By laying down of the hands. When somebody prays over you, when somebody lays hands on you and prays over you, God can give you the spirit of wisdom. Because there's such a thing as the spirit of wisdom. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 to 3. There is such a thing as the spirit of wisdom. It is the spirit that was there at creation. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 19, by wisdom the Lord founded the heavens and the earth. So you can access, okay, thank you, Isaiah 11, yes, from verse 1. And they shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom. There is a spirit of wisdom. There is a spirit of understanding. There is a spirit of counsel. There is the spirit of might. There is the spirit of knowledge. And there is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And verse 3, it said, And it shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So there is a spirit of wisdom, and the spirit can be imparted by laying on of hands. That's why next week Sunday, don't miss it. It's our anointing service. And it happens only once a month. What do we do? We pray over the oil, and I place it upon your head, and I pray over you. Once a month. And then miracles begin to happen. The spirit of wisdom can be imparted through the laying on of hands. Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 29. Joshua received an impartation. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 9, I'm sorry. 34, 9. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 9. There was an impartation. Hmm. There was an impartation. The Bible says, and Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Joshua was a nobody. When Moses was choosing 70 elders to take over, Joshua was not there. Joshua was not among the 70 elders. Moses was a great man. A leader of leaders. And when it was time to go, he chose 70 elders. And Joshua was not there. But one day the Lord told him, there is this young boy called Joshua. Call him. Lay your hands on him. I will fill him with wisdom. And he will be your replacement. The spirit of wisdom was what separated Joshua from the 70 elders. But that wisdom came by the laying on of hands and prayers. When prayers are said over you, the spirit of wisdom comes upon you and your head begins to magnetize divine ideas. Your head begins to brainstorm, to charge up. You begin to receive revelations from the word. You be, be, begin to, to process complex situations and synthesize them for your profiting. The spirit of wisdom can be imparted by the laying on of hands. Paul told Timothy not to neglect the gift of God upon his life by laying of hands. 2 Timothy 1.6 2 Timothy 1.6 you can receive an impartation of the spirit of wisdom. And I believe God that next week when we come, as hands are laid upon you and oil is, and you are anointed, the spirit of wisdom will rest upon you. 
in the name of Jesus. 2 Timothy 1.6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is indeed by the putting on of my hands, one of the gifts of God that comes through laying of hands is wisdom. And wisdom is the principal thing. Finally, number six, how do you access divine wisdom? It's by living a lifestyle of praise. Praise and thanksgiving to God. I'm telling you, praise attracts God to you. Thanksgiving, joyfulness attracts God to you. And when God comes, he blesses you. One of the things God blesses you with is wisdom. When you are joyful, always rejoicing in the Lord. You know, when you choose joy in spite of what you are going through, then God comes and gives you a solution that gets you out of where you are. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Last week, Sunday, we heard about choosing joy. Choosing joy in spite of what is happening to you, in spite of what is going on around you. Still choose joy. And when you rejoice before the Lord, he will come and show you the way out, the solution. I told you about Ben Carson, right? I told you about Ben Carson. Ben Carson, well, now he's a politician. But before he became a politician, he was a neurosurgeon. The first neurosurgeon to separate co-joint twins. You know co-joint twins? They are joined maybe by the head or by the hand. He was the first ever to separate them. And what did Ben Carson say? He said any time he wants to perform any surgery, the first thing he does is he sings and dances around the patient. He just sings. I'm sure the nurses and all the medical professionals will be wondering, what's wrong with this guy? What is he doing? <laughs> he knows what he's doing. The patient is there on the operating ta table. He dances around and sings. And sings. I heard, him, I heard Ben Carson say this himself. That he dances around and sings and just rejoices in the Lord. He sings a song. And then, when the surgery starts, he said, there is an, he always sees an invisible hand holding his hands, helping him do the surgery. Holding his hand. The secret of men are in their stories. Can you please choose joy today? Choose to rejoice in the Lord always. Choose to be happy. We all have things in our lives that makes us sad. We have fears. We have challenges. But we must choose joy. We must choose praise. We must choose to be happy. It's a choice and it's the choice of the wise. Oh, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 tells us the story of something that happened to a farmer. Everything was going bad. Everything was not working. Everything was corrupted. Huh. Until he found the answer. The answer was in choosing joy. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17, the Bible says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, huh, neither shall fruit be in the vine. The labor of the holy shall fail. The field shall yield no meat. Nothing was working for this farmer. The flock shall be cut off the fold. And there shall be no head in the stalls. Nothing was working. He was having multiple bad days. Multiple bad weeks. Back to back. Multiple bad months. Even for some people, multiple back years. Multiple bad years. Back to back. But he said something here. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet, in spite of that, I will joy in the God of my salvation. It's a choice. It's a choice. I will rejoice. I will joy in the Lord. And when he did that, look at verse 19. God changed his story. God changed his story. He said, the Lord, God is my strength. And he will make my feet like a hind's feet. <laughs> and he will make me to walk upon my high places. After he has chosen joy. After he has rejoiced in the Lord. 
Joy is wisdom for solutions. Joy is wisdom for change of season. You want to change your season? Maybe you don't like this season of your life. It's like a nightmare. You can't wait to wake up from this nightmare. The way to wake up and change your season is to rejoice. Praise God. Put on YouTube some songs. Just worship him. Don't ask for anything. Just thank him. When we are singing in church, rejoice before him. Oh, I love it. When I'm playing the keyboard, you probably saw me doing it today. First thing I do is I just lift up my hands. And I just thank him. I, that's what I do when you see me doing that. Is I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then God takes over. God takes over. It's a choice. I end with this scripture, Psalm 16, verse 11. Let's wrap up. Psalm 16, verse 11. Oh, God is speaking to somebody today. You want wisdom? You always want the solution? Out of every challenge of life? Praise me. Don't ask for anything. No, just thank me. Just rejoice and watch me work for you. Psalm 16 verse 11. Thou will show me the path of life. You will show me the way out. You will give me the solution. For in your presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, pleasures forevermore. The fullness of joy needs to come before the pleasures follow. The fullness of joy, that will show me the path of life. This is one scripture that has governed my life. There was, there's been days where I just, I just sit down because it's like, can today be over, please? I can, only ha- I can only take this much. I've had days like that. I've had weeks like that where I'm just like, gosh, can today be Sunday? I want to start all over. But I remember when I praise God, my season change. My season gets better. Things begin to turn around. I begin to receive wisdom or solutions out of problems. I begin to receive wisdom. For he will show us the path of life when we have fullness of joy in our hearts. Can we bow our heads this morning and let us thank God. Thank him for everything. Thank him for the good, the bad, the ugly. Just thank him. Thank him. Lord, I'm grateful. Even for the things I think are not working, thank you. Even for where I am right now, thank you. Even though I've not received what I want, I I still say thank you. Can somebody just thank God this, this afternoon? Just thank him. Praise him. Celebrate him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are grateful. We don't have everything, but we have you. And when we have you, you will give us everything. And so we say thank you. We are grateful. We appreciate you. Thank you, Father. Because you are going to change our season from good to better. And from better to best. Thank you. And thank you Lord. Even for your word that you sent to us today. We say thank you. For the revelation of your word. Now we know how to access your wisdom. Lord we give you praise. And we give you glory. Thank you Father. In Jesus mighty name we've prayed. Amen and amen. This morning or this afternoon. I want to speak to somebody that's watching us over the internet who would like to give their hearts to the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Job chapter 28 verse 28. We read that earlier. Job chapter 28 verse 28. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. I want to pray for somebody who's struggling with any kind of sin, any kind of addiction, Yes, thank you. Job 28 verse 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. 
you, you are saying in your heart, I've tried all I can to stop. I've made New Year resolutions. I've done all I can. And I'm still struggling with this. This morning, I would like to pray with you and believe God for a change of story for you. The same God that brought me out of the miry clay, he's available to take you out of anything you're struggling with, any form of addiction that the enemy may have put you away. So if you are here this, this afternoon, you would like me to pray for you or pray with you and you want to break free there are some things you want to stop doing. There are some things you want to start doing. I want to pray with you. Because that is the only way you can qualify for the wisdom of God. So if you're in any of these two categories, please rise on your feet. Close your eyes. And say this prayer of faith after me. Say after me, Lord Jesus. I come to you today. Just the way I am. I am a sinner. And I know. That you are the Savior. Please forgive me of all my sins. And wash me with your blood. And make me your child again. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. That Jesus Christ. Is Lord. Now I know. That I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And I'm free from the power of sin to serve the living God. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Amen. Please keep your eyes closed and your head bowed. Father, I thank you for these ones who have come to you today. They know and they believe that you are the Savior. The only one that can save from sin. Therefore, Father, I ask that this morning you will save them from sin. Save them from every sinful habit, sinful lifestyle, sinful thoughts. Every form of addiction be broken now in the name of Jesus Christ. I decree that the same grace that brought these ones forward to live for Jesus, may that same grace keep them in Christ for life. I pray that every one of us that have given our hearts to the Lord, we will not miss heaven. We will not miss eternity with Christ. We will not lose our salvation. We will not go from grass to from, from grace to grass. We will not go from grace to grass in the name of Jesus. And on the last day when you come to take us all home, may our garment be white as snow, may no iniquity be found in us, and may we remain rapturable with you, our Father. Thank you, Lord, for doing this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory be to God. There is joy in heaven over one soul that repents. Let there be joy here on the earth. In Jesus' name. All right. We're about to close. Uh, but let me just remind us of a couple things. And a couple programs coming up. We pray online on the last, day, the last Saturday of the month. So we're going to be praying again this Saturday online at 2 o'clock in the morning. Amen. I know some people are not able to make it because that's their bedtime. I understand. <laughs> that used to be my bedtime too until the Lord asked us to start doing it at 2 o'clock in the morning. So every 2 o'clock in the morning, the last Friday of the month, we are meeting online. And it's, it's totally fine. I've had people that watch it in the morning because it's recorded. It's on the website, on the, on the YouTube so if you, if, if you have to go to bed or if you're at work, please don't watch when you're at work. That's not scriptural. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and what is the Lord to the Lord. I don't encourage, except you're on break time and then you can watch us for a little while and go back to work. But when you're at work, if you're working the night shift, please focus on the night shift. And if you have to sleep, that's fine. You can wake up in the morning and you will have the recording on our Facebook and all our social media platforms. There have been people who watch that service and they receive a prophetic word from the Lord. I, I can't even give you an example now of people who... In fact, there was one... Okay, I think I remember this one. Let me just share this real quick. The Lord gave me a prophetic word about somebody who was having, I believe, 
uh, here in infection. And the Lord said the person is healed as I was speaking. And this is me. I just said it online. Do you know who that person was? It was my biological mom. She was watching online. And I didn't know she was watching. She never told me anything was happening. She never told me she was going through that. It was my, my own biological mom in Chicago that received, that that word was for. So that's the way the prophetic works, you know. God can speak about anybody at any time. You want to be there to receive it. But I totally understand if maybe due to work, you're not able to watch live, but you can also watch when you wake up in the morning. So we're going to be doing that this Saturday at 2 o'clock in the morning. On Sunday, of course, we're going to be here again. Um, again, I'm going to be starting a new series of teachings. I think we have exhausted or almost exhausted this series of teachings. I'm going to be starting a new one on a different topic next week Sunday. And next week Sunday also is going to be our anointing service. Okay, I'm going to anoint every one of us and pray over us in the name of the Lord. And there will be a testimony in Jesus' name. We are also meeting on Wednesday, the 27th. All that service is online, okay? At least for now, okay? When we have the number, then we can bring it back into the sanctuary. So let's meet online on Wednesday, the 27th at 7.30 p.m. And on Saturday, the 30th at 2 a.m. And then we'll come back here 1st of October, by the grace of God, at 10 a.m. I have a special announcement. Um, the Lord has been asking me to do this this year, and I've been procrastinating. You know, if I l- let me confess my faults to you. The Lord asked me to do this in July, and I've not done it. So I'm going to be doing it. What did the Lord ask me to do? The Lord spoke to me very clearly at the beginning of the year to have a men's conference. In fact, the Lord called it Present Father's Conference. Present Fathers. The Lord has been asking me to do it since January, and this is what, September. So by the grace of God, we are going to start that in November. So mark your calendars. November 4, we are going to be coming here. All the men, the male figures, please bring them here. We are going to start having a conference, an annual conference, to talk, to pray, to plan together. All right? I was telling my people, I said, um, I don't want to do it like a service. I'm going to do it like a question and answer session. So we're going to rearrange the chairs because I want it to be intimate. Men have a way of bottling things up to get to, to, for you to get a man to talk. <laughs> so we're going to create that environment where men can freely talk and share what is happening in their lives, what kind of challenges because we want to be present fathers, present to our families, present in the community, present in the church, present to our children and our spouses. So we're going to do that November 4. Please mark your calendars. We're going to do it. I have to do it. If I don't do it, I will be acting in disobedience to the Holy Spirit, and that's not good for me, and that's not good for all of us as a church. So please mark your calendars. It's about six weeks away. We're going to have it here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Saturday, November 4, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's rise up as we close the service. Amen. That's all I have. Let's thank God for today's service. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everyone that you brought. Thank you for the impact of your word in our lives. Lord, we give you praise. Can somebody say thank you to Jesus for this month of September? We say thank you for everyone you brought to today's service. Thank you for your word that you sent. We say thank you for the testimonies that we received today. Say thank you. Lord, we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Can you speak to your week? Can you speak and prophesy to your week? Can you calm every storm the enemy may be planning for you this week? Speak to your week and say peace be still in the name of Jesus. Can you command the mountains to move? name of Jesus Christ. Mountains be thou removed. 
be cast into the sea. In the name of Jesus. Now begin to receive the blessings of God as we enter into a new month, new things, new testimonies, new favor, new help, new money, new job, new finances, everything you desire of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. And we say thank you because you have done it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I join my faith with yours and I decree that be it unto you according to all you have asked of the Lord. I decree in the name of Jesus that as you end this week, as you end this month, every evil report, every evil, every plans of the devil will end. The afflictions you saw before today, you see them no more. In the name of Jesus Christ, I prophesy as you step into this week, step into favor, step into liftings, step into blessings, step into help, step into the fullness of God's plans for your life. In the name of Jesus, I decree the sun shall not smite you by the day, nor the moon by the night. I command and decree that the angels of the Lord will keep charge over you. They will bear you up in their hands and you will not dash your foot against a stone. I decree that every day of this week are the days the Lord has made and all of us, you and I and our family members shall rejoice and be glad in them. It is well with you. Go in peace. Return with testimonies. And may the God of this commission, my God, grant you the answers to the desires of your heart. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Let's share the grace and fellowship. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all in Jesus' name. And surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Peace. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for coming today. God bless you. I hope you were blessed. Please share this with somebody. Let them know that God is here at the House of Light Assembly waiting to bless them. The Lord be with you in Jesus' name. Have a great day in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord.